Okay. You're live. Hello and good evening, everyone. This is Moline Jackson. I am honored to be hosting this three-part series, uh, this three-part speaker series, and I want to thank you very much for your patience. We were having a bit of technical difficulties in the background, but you have made it to this first session titled New Discoveries on Sacred Ground, where we will play, we will pay homage to uh, two local pioneers, Miss uh, Sarah Lee and Melinda Jackson. Uh, this speaker series is the kickoff to the Farallon and Briggs Cheney master plan. And even though this uh, speaker series is a tradition at the planning department, this is the first time that we've done it virtually, the first time we've done it in the spring season, and the first time we've done it during a global pandemic. In the 2000 and I'm sorry, the 2021 virtual speaker series will be the first of many community conversations and, and subsequent events uh, that are themed after and inspired by the, Brig the Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan. With the scope of work being approved by the planning board in, in 2021 of April, we are anxious to get started with this process and other uh, engagement activities. Like this one, we will have uh, many, a multitude of other uh, community engagement events, including active listening sessions, a summer photo contest, door knocking, um, you name it, we're gonna try and do it. Uh, the planning board recognizes, the planning department recognizes and acknowledges the role that our plans and policies have played in creating and per per perpetuating uh, racial inequities in Montgomery County. We are committed to transforming the way that we work as we seek to address and mitigate and eliminate inequities from the past and develop planning solutions to create equitable communities in the future. While it will take some time to fully develop new methodologies for equity in planning policy, in planning, in planning policies, um, we are fully committed to this effort for equity in our planning policies. We cannot delay uh, this process, so we are we are jumping right in feet first. I'd like to um, introduce, oh, well, before I introduce our, our host, our I'm sorry, before I introduce our opening speaker who's going to be delivering our opening remarks, I also want to encourage uh, dialogue to happen in the chat and the Q&A we will be having after this film. This film is entitled and it's inspired by Sarah Lee and Melinda Jackson, New Discoveries on Sacred Grounds. We just have two simple ground rules, uh, which are that, of course, we encourage you to leave comments in the Q&A, and we value different perspectives and alternative thoughts um, as, we, as we, we encourage you to be mindful and concise in your comments, um, but, to, but to have dialogue after the Q&A. Um, I would like to introduce our host and our deputy planning director, Ms. Tanya Stern, who oversees five different departments ranging from historic preservation uh, to countywide planning, planning policies and data analysis in the planning department. I'm going to turn it over to Tanya right now. Um, Tanya? Thank you, Maureen, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm going to keep my opening remarks uh, short since we are getting started uh, a little past our original start time, um, but basically wanted to kind of lay the groundwork for tonight's discussion. We really want to focus on the importance of telling stories, and we're really looking at how storytelling is an important part of the planning process. As planners, uh, one of the first things that we're taught in planning school in uh, learning how to develop a master plan for a community is to write what's called an existing conditions chapter. And it could be kind of dry and boring, but it's actually really important uh, part of a, of a plan because it takes a look at what is actually happening in the community right now, but also what is the history of that community. And we also, as part of our community engagement for plans, it's really, really important in talking with community members to find out about the stories of a community both the history of that community, but also what's going on right now. What is the present story of that community that we as planners really need to understand 
and appreciate because it will help us in figuring out uh, what types of uh, recommendations and other strategies will be beneficial to, to create a better future uh, for the community where we're doing planning. Uh, one of the things that Maureen asked me to speak about briefly was uh, how I think about history and storytelling um, in my career as a planner. I am a uh, native Washingtonian, born in Washington, DC, third generation native Washingtonian. And uh, one, of the, one of the benefits of my family being from DC for multiple generations is that I have heard the stories of my father, my grandparents of DC during the time period prior to my birth. But I have my own stories as someone who grew up in DC and have seen the changes in my hometown over the last number of decades. Um, I also you know, really understand how important it is to understand both your personal stories as a planner that you bring to your work um, as a planner when you work with communities, as well as understanding the stories of the community where we are doing planning. And so again, you know, this, this film and this, this session is an opportunity to help to spark conversations about history, about uh, historic resources, cultural resources in communities, um, but also what are the stories that you as residents are bringing to this process? Uh, what are the stories that us as planners uh, are bringing to this work as well? And so I want to uh, just tee up the film a little bit as Molly mentioned, uh, this film was inspired by the legacy of two local sheroes, Miss Sarah Lee and Miss Melinda Jackson. These were two phenomenal women who had been enslaved, but later they were able to purchase their own properties and have their own homes. And this is obviously was really, really um, very significant during the time. But even today, you know, home ownership and housing that is affordable are still privileges for a number of our residents. And so this is one of the reasons that as part of Thrive Montgomery 2050, which is our updated general plan, uh, which we have recently uh, completed the draft of and submitted to our county council, and they will be beginning their process to review this plan uh, starting this summer. It really focuses a lot on the importance of housing. Seen through the lens of racial equity and social justice, housing is a major way to gain access to and build generational wealth. So again, this film is intended to spark conversations about Ms. Lee's and Ms. Jackson's personal experiences, as well as Montgomery County's historic and cultural resources. But we also want to use this film to acknowledge similar but untold stories about other local pioneers. So with that, let's get started with our film. December of 2018, Christmas morning, um, my mom and I were at a, on a walk here and we saw a family with their dogs um, up in this hill and we knew that it was a cemetery because at the top there's actually a plaque that says it's um, Sara Lee Family Cemetery and we just reminded them that this is a cemetery um, and they're really apologetic about it and that's what kind of kick-started this whole project um, and we got in touch with you and with a bunch of um, county members and we got to get this sign that reminds people before actually entering that it's Lee Cemetery. So, yeah, and I I want to know because I noticed you didn't tell the audience you won a, a, a prestigious award with the Coalition for the Protection of Maryland Burial Sites for your advocacy for this site. And one of the things that you help bring awareness to parks is that we do need to, for example, have our brown and white markers at the cemetery so folks know that these features are here and these cultural resources are open to the public. Uh, we want patrons to, to come to our cemeteries and feel that they have a space where they can reflect and memorialize um, members of the community who are no longer here. So it, it, when it's sun up to sundown, our parks are open. That includes our cultural resources like our cemeteries. So this is the plaque that's at the top of the hill. Um, and of course, when people are walking by, they're not going to first notice it. And before there's anything, there is not very much signage on the front. Um, it was only like a sign that says, don't let your dog off the leash. So people would assume that it's a dog park um, without realizing and reading this. So, 
Yeah, and I, I want to note this uh, particular granite marker, this was produced by Parks in 1980 when we started to develop this park. And so you're right. Unfortunately, unless people come up here and see this, they wouldn't be aware that the, until we put the brown and white marker, they wouldn't have been aware this was a cemetery because the tombstones that were on the family property at one time are, are now missing. But we know from oral history with the family, there were between 29 and 50 burials on the property. And that's one of the next kind of aspects of this project moving forward because, you know, research never ends with cultural resources is is we need to accumulate that oral history with the family the descendants they're the experts they know Sarah Lee um, we want them to come walk the property and talk with us and tell us their recollections not only the cemetery but the entire property so we have a better, better understanding of where the house was at and what it looked like and how they used the land so that would be the next iteration and perhaps the next interpretive sign that we work on for this property that would be a topic that we would include yeah. and i do want to say um you know the times that i've been here um, we've both noted people leave objects here so they're clearly using the space and people always ask questions when they see you at the cemetery they want to know more and so that reflects not only a need uh, for information but an interest in this this cultural resource yeah. so I know when we get the interpretive sign in that the the public will be grateful because they'll they'll learn more about Sarah Lee and her family my name is Jamie Ferguson I'm senior historian with Montgomery County Parks and I'm here today with an amazing local teenager who's done a ton of research and stewardship on behalf of the Sarah Lee Cemetery. Her name is Ella LaGrange, and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you tonight. Ella, thank you for participating. Thank you for having me. Right, so I'm gonna jump right into it. I, I'd like you to tell us what you know about Sarah Lee and what's important about Sarah Lee to you. Um, so Sarah Lee, Miss Sarah Lee was the wealthiest African-American woman in Montgomery County after the Civil War. Um, and she spent 43 years as an enslaved person on Mr. Evanshaw's turkey flight plantation in Prince George's County. Um, and in 1854, Mr. Shaw left a will in which he manumitted Miss Sarah Lee and her children and left her 137.25 acres of land um, in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and in 1867, three years after the Maryland legislature abolished slavery within the old line state, um, Miss Sarah Lee um, took it upon herself to go get her. Um, an official deed tied to her land where she would actually have a plan like an actual plan of her land done um, and she was one of the only 10 african-american property owners and again the wealthiest african-american woman in all of montgomery county great to talk to you um and can you tell the audience your name and your relationship to both sarah lee and melinda jack uh, my name is michael aaron withers and uh, i am the great 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 grandson of sarah lee and I am a probably fourth cousin removed from uh, Melinda Jackson. This has been a very uplifting and inspiring story to uh, the family and myself because there, there's enough bad news, but this is great news. And, and we have some folks that have created a legacy that we can look up to. It certainly gives us something to lean on and a foundation that all of us are searching for um to to stand on and it's certainly a story that we can pass on to the children and and feel very proud and and with great reverence uh to these two women for the trails of their blaze for us So uh, my name is Brian Crane. I'm with the Montgomery County Planning Department in the Historic Preservation Program. And with me today is Varna Boyd. Varna is an archeologist with Dovetail Cultural Resources Group and formerly from URS Corporation. And she was involved with the excavations at the Melinda Jackson Homestead site at the intersection of the Intercounty Connector and Columbia Pike. And it was work that she and URS were doing in connection with the construction of the ICC. And they were on contract with 
the Maryland Department of Highways, uh, the, the Maryland SHA, the, the Highway Department. And so, so Varna, it's great to have you uh, here today and, and looking forward to uh, uh, talking about this really interesting site. So um, the, the Melinda Jackson uh, Homestead site was a, uh, an African-American household that um, uh, from the late 1800s and early 1900s that we learned about through history and archaeology. And Varna is going to be talking to us about that this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and the slides, the great slides that that uh, that Varna put together and got some questions that we'll uh, we'll share out. So, Varna, can you tell us about why archaeology was done at the uh, Melinda Jackson Homestead site? Yes, um, Maryland State Highway Administration had to comply with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, um, which required they consider the effects of their project on cultural resources, such as archaeological sites like the Jackson Homestead. Great. And so what did what did archaeologists actually do? Uh, so we went out to the site once, you know, once it had been identified and it was clear that there was potentially something significant there. We did a lot of research and we did um, full excavation of the house and samples of the yard so that we could uh, tell a bit of the story of what rural life was like for this African-American family in the mid um, 19th into the early 20th centuries. Yeah, and you did a, a lot of historical research about this site too, am, am I right? We did, we did extensive historic research as well as oral history with descendants of the family that we found um, and, and identified um, not only the original property owner who sold uh, the property to Melinda Jackson who had uh, previously been a slave at, at that uh, plantation, um, but also her family um, who continued to live on the site um, afterwards and expanded the site um, even further. Right, and then uh, so so Anne Downs, uh, who is a you know a, a woman, I, I I guess she was unmarried. Am I am I right that that? Correct. She was a single woman who inherited the property from her father. Um, and she owned several slaves, including uh, Melinda Jackson, and we believe Melinda Jackson's mother, and then eventually um, some of Melinda's children uh, who were born into slavery. Right, and then after the Civil War, she actually sold part of the property to, uh, to Melinda Jackson. She did, and, um, and so the family who had lived there previously continued to live in the same um, house, which is originally a slave house, um, it was a single uh, pen slave house that eventually the family expanded to a Harlan, hall and parlor uh, style house and enlarged it. So um, you, 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 growing family. So when you say single pen, you mean it was a one room, it was a one room house. Basically. Correct, correct. And then they added on to it and made it bigger. They did. Yeah, here's the, here's the Jackson family as they showed up in the, I guess this is the 1870 census, huh? Correct. Yeah. Yes. And and th and that's where so you, the historic map shows them. So so uh, Fairland post uh, post office, you know. So you see uh, down the middle, um, if I've got my cursor going here. That's that's old Columbia, old Columbia Pike, mm -hmm. and and so the intercounty connector kind of goes across here. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And then the. What happened in, in 1915? It burned down, right? Yeah, so um, around 1915, the home catastrophically burned. It was um, burned to the point it could not be salvaged um, and burned to the point that the family really did not have um, the opportunity to go in and recover much. It appears um, that pretty much everything that was in the home uh, remained in the home um, after it was burned, and uh, is what were recovered archaeologically. Wow. Oh, 
you did oral history too, right? We did. We did oral history. There, uh, the family has um, a, a, a informal uh, family historian that we spoke to, but we also um, had a number of events with the family where we had them at the archaeological site, at the archaeology lab, and we talked to them about um, their family history. Um, they had no idea that this site existed. Wow. Um, and so it was very meaningful to the family to kind of put a little more, um, you know, depth to the family tree information. So, Mike, you know, you kind of inter introduced yourself to me as the family historian, and I love that title that you've taken on. And I, I just want to note, um, your family is full of a, a lot of historians, and I know that y'all have been working behind the scenes, collecting, you know, all this research to help develop your family tree. How have y'all been doing that in, during COVID? Well, it, it, it's been um, through Microsoft Teams, and, and I certainly don't want to take the, uh, the credit away from some folks that have been doing this for 10 years, um, Cousin June uh, Lee, who has, she said she started about 10 years ago with this project and she has provided the backdrop for the information that we're talking about today. She's done a lot of research and also Angie also, which is uh, one of uh, Melinda Jackson's uh, great grandchildren has done a lot of work. Her and Curtis Crutchfield uh, as well, who part of the Melinda Jackson story as well as Sarah Lee's story. So there's a lot of folks who have worked on uh, the family history, they're, they're really important um, to try to maintain some of the legacy and, and heritage of the Black family in Montgomery County, because a lot of time that is, it's an oversight or an afterthought. So it, it, I think it's very important for the Park Service to, to take these stories in consideration as they come up with their master plans and happen to be in the engineering field and understand how that process works and how important it is. So it's, it's, you know, it's essential that park and planning considers uh, these sites and these legacies and the history uh, of, of these families and, and uh, especially our, our family on both sides, an important part that they played in the growth and development of Montgomery County. So uh, I think it's essentially important. Absolutely, I agree. And, um, you know, the Woodlawn Museum of several years ago, we displayed some of the artifacts from Melinda Jackson's homestead from the um, archaeological excavation. So we, we were really fortunate to be in a position to use those to talk about um, the African-American experience in the post-emancipation years. And, you know, I'm really excited that we can tell Sarah Lee's story and her, her life following um, being enslaved uh, in Prince George's County and what that was like for her. Um, to be a landholder in Montgomery County. And so I'm glad that we have interpretive signage. We have the ability to tell her story. And again, to be able to have your family help craft that story through all these memories and photos. And I'm, I'm so appreciative for you and your family and their role and leadership in this project. Um, Maryland's history is a big cultural resource and there's always a story still waiting to be told. Um, and there's very rich and important history within our community, and it's our responsibility to protect and recognize um, these stories. Like, for example, Miss Sarah Lee's story in her family heritage. Um, and I think her story is just so important because it symbolizes the amazing history of African Americans in our community that is not always told and remembered. I absolutely agree. And, you know, I'm, I feel really fortunate that this cemetery brought us together. Um, one of my work programs is managing uh, the cemeteries that are on parkland in Montgomery County and we have at least 15 there's I, I'm confident there's probably more because uh, MNC PPC manages over 20 percent of land in Montgomery County and a lot of cemeteries just like Sarah Lee there's no tombstones left mm -hmm. and people shouldn't immediately write off a graveyard or a burial site because they don't see tombstones because it's likely the graves are still there. It's still a resting place. And those spaces deserve the same kind of respect that we give to buildings and, and farms and whatnot. They are historic resources. They tell us about our past. And, and I know this because I'm older than you. Um, and as a parent, you start thinking about your own legacy and your own history. And you want to ensure that your children know that same story and they pass on that story. And I know that this weekend I worked at a 
another African American cemetery in um, Silver Spring. And when you look at the tombstones that are at that particular church, um, you can tell that the African American community, literally, it was important to them to put whether it was their their own finances or literally their own hands, they're making their own tombstones for these graves. These are resting places that are really important to them. Um, and it's really important for planners to make sure when they start doing uh, these projects is that they invest time and resources to have a historian and an archaeologist on staff who can do the research to identify these resources and then find a way to interpret that, interpret these histories, these lost communities, these lost people, and make sure their story is told as part of the community history. Mm -hmm. So uh, now what were the what did you actually find on the on the site? So um, the majority of what we found was within the home or immediately adjacent to the home. There were some other features, but we were really focused on the house site itself. Uh -huh. So the single pen, which is the right side image that you see there, was the original slave house. It had a cellar um, and was the kitchen ultimately um, when the house expanded um, and they added on a parlor side. Um, on, the, on the left. Correct. Um, so a lot of kitchen and storage activities over on the single pen side okay. and um, evidence for um, sewing machine, um, a hutch, um, a pie safe, um, obviously a table and um, some storage in there as well. Um, and uh, then we were able to identify the distribution of artifacts and actually start to be able to piece together not only what artifacts were there, but where they were. And we can say the pie safe was on, you know, this wall and the stove was on that wall and really piece together what the house looked like when the family lived there. And these are examples, these aren't photographs of, of the actual house, but, but similar kinds, what a similar house might have looked like. That's correct. That's another single pen that would have been very similar and another house that started um, as a single pen and, and evolved into a Holland parlor. Right. OK. And then there, and, and you mentioned the fire and we know that it was really hot. You know, it, right? it was. It, it burned to the point that it melted glass in some areas, um, which indicates it exceeded 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, as you can see on the left, it also melted many artifacts together. Um, and on the bottom of the slide, um, that spidering and the jigsaw fracturing is evidence of water being thrown uh, in an effort to firefight. Um, so okay, so they tried to fire. Yeah, fight they, fire. Okay, right? they, try, they tried to put it up, but they obviously were not successful. Correct. Wow. It was just too intense. Yeah. So, but we also found a, a lot of uh, objects that that um, that survived, so that you could you know figure out what they showed. And it, and it seems like having you know when I went through all these slides, you found things that from like every part of of, of the family's life. We did. It was a fascinating look at this um, African Americans' families' daily life and work life and um, education and play with. Uh, everything from, you know, their cookware uh, to games and toys right. and um, musical instruments. It, it was a fascinating um, look into their life, including furniture. Yeah, you mentioned that like with, you know, I've got some uh, some uh, tableware on, on the, the screen right now. You mentioned that there were that it looked like they had like sort of everyday uh, place as well as nicer, you know, special occasion. Uh, right, we, yes, we found multiple sets of dishes um, and indicative of their daily wear and then like maybe their Sunday best China dishes for special events and holidays and that kind of thing. And we've got some, it looks like some uh, medicine bottle glasses. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, so those were uh, common at the time, you know, taking care of health and, and so these are, are those are, are, um, are those stirrups? 
These are, are coin purses. Oh, coin purses. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, they're clasps from little cloth coin purses. Oh. And, um, and some coins that wow. we found. Oh, and he, here's some, some jewelry. Uh, so I'll get yes. some rings, pins. So this is our re religious medallion. Yes. Yeah, and some beads. Right. Um, so clearly the family um, was participating in the local economy and, and the, had enough um, expendable income that they could purchase jewelry and uh, personal items, you know, watches, yeah. um, games, toys, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, this was interesting. You know, so yes. they, they were politically involved in, in some way or certainly politically aware. That's correct. Yeah, it was, again, very meaningful to the family that this medallion was found on the site, given that Melinda was a former slave. And, and this is obviously part of the campaign, um, you know, for Lincoln and Hamlin. So, uh, you know, they found that very meaningful to their family history. And of course, Melinda wouldn't have been able to, to vote. Women didn't have the, the vote yet. Correct. Uh, so, uh, um, but it seems like that, you know, that didn't stop them from, you know, being wanting to be aware and engaged with the um, politics of the time. I think that's really interesting. Absolutely. Um, and more medicine bottles and, and tools. Um, right. Oh, wow, like corset stuff. Yes. Yeah, we found a lot of undergarments, um, you know, garter parts and um, as well as parts of shoes and buckles and um, a lot of buttons. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, a, a large quantity of buttons. Originally, we thought that might mean uh, that there was a seamstress at okay. that house. Um, but sure. when we started to do more research on things, it was clear that uh, because this is, you know, pre-zipper, uh, the clothing had a lot of buttons. And since the fire burned with all of their clothing in it, um, yeah. oh gosh, we found historically no evidence of them being seamstress. Um, it was clear that it was just all from the clothing that burned. And yeah, we've got some some dice here. Yes. I, I, and, and pipes. So I'm going to skip ahead here. That yeah, there were all these toys. I I, I thought this was mm -hmm. really poignant. You know, yes. that, that the household had young children, and so you have you have marbles and and dolls. And it's interesting that you know the doll uh, is a uh, an early example of a of a doll that was designed to you know to look like someone who was African American and not just you know, a white person's doll. Or Correct. All yes. that's white, but but. Um, you know, so that so the children would have had a, a, a doll that looked like them. Yes, yes, very much so. We did find doll parts that were white, um, but like you, we found um, you know the African American doll, um, you know, very um, interesting. And again, I think um, speaks to the family's right. uh, participation in the local economy in Fairland. Yeah. Uh, and some uh, sewing stuff, scissors, and, and, right. and these are oh, oh, these are parts of uh, the stove, right? That we would have used for cooking, right? They had a cook stove in the kitchen and a heating stove in the parlor. Mm. And this is a uh, so an artist uh, conjecture about what it might have looked like. Is that right? Correct. Correct. That's just based on the archaeology. Obviously, what's above ground is a little conjectural. Um, based on the distribution of artifacts like window glass, we were pretty confident about where the window locations were. Okay. So this is so when the family was still uh, living under slavery, it would have been a very small, just one room place to live. But then when they owned the, the property, they were able to expand it quite significantly into a, Correct. In a much more substantial house. Correct. And you'll see on the single pin side, um, on the far left at the bottom, uh, the entrance uh, to, the uh, this, to the cellar. You right. It would have been a so that would say when you say cellar it was a it was a, um, a a space underneath the floor. Correct, and it would it uh, contains um, store food storage. Uh -huh. uh, not only would have contained like root vegetables and things, uh, but we found remnants of mason jars where they had had canning. Um, we also did. Um, 
uh, analysis of the plant and animal remains at the house. And so we could get to the diet in terms of what they were eating in terms of animals and plants, you know, like strawberries and, um, you know, a lot of cow and pig and that kind of thing. Uh, public art is a really important way uh, to bring history to life. And as you know, Lee, we don't have any historic photographs of her. So um, public art is a good way to use your creativity and your imagination to, to think of what Sarah looked like. So if you could tell us how you came up with that, I would love to hear that. Yeah, of course. So um, I made this collage portrait um, to represent Miss Sarah Lee because again, we had no photographical evidence of what she looked like. Um, and I chose these cream and red colors as fabrics um, and pearl accessories to speak to her well. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge the different possible complexions Miss Sarah Lee could have been without picking a skin tone randomly. Yeah, you've um, you've been extremely helpful with interpretive signage. I know the first time that you and I met, I met you and your brother and your father at Woodlawn. And it's wonderful to have a young perspective when we're developing interpretive signage because there are things that um, I am older than you. So there are things that I take for granted as an older person that, you know, you don't really, it doesn't always, you kind of take for granted. And, and you ask, well, can you tell me about, more about female property ownership? And I kind of take for granted, and now it's 2021 now, but when you and I met, it was a few years ago, um, you take for granted that women can easily own property, they can easily pay taxes, but that certainly wasn't necessarily the case back then, and especially for an African American woman. So it's it's so great to have young set of eyes reading content and asking really thoughtful questions. And because I'm not in the classroom anymore, I, I kind of live vicariously through you. It's amazing to see um, the stewardship mentality that you have. And, and I see that growing in our community is that um, you guys do want to take um, ownership of these resources and help protect them and help tell these stories. And interpretive signage is the best way for us in the parks department where we don't always have the ability to build museums. We do have the ability to do interpretive signage. And the great thing about these projects is, is it allows me to work with the community, work with you, uh, work with the descendants of the Sarah Lee family, which is very exciting. Um, and let everyone have a voice and a contribution in memorializing, in this case, Sarah Lee and, and her legacy. I want to talk a little bit about you know, how this relates to the community today and to, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning our work in the planning department to, uh, to update the, the master plan for the Fairland area. And, you know, uh, we would like uh, to be able to let the history of of the community in, inform our conversations um, today. So, can you talk a little bit about? Um, I'll tell you, you've mentioned a few times uh, interacting with descendants, and and um, you know, tell uh, tell us more about you know, what happened with the site and the material from the site. Right. Well, the material from the site went to the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab, which is the state. Okay repository. Um, and so the artifacts are there um, forever for future researchers. So people can go and look at them and do additional research if they want. Okay. The site, of course, was destroyed uh, by the construction of the ICC. Um, but at, uh, Maryland State Highways uh, did a fabulous job of doing public outreach and education, not just with the family, but um, presenting in conferences and Right. Uh, local fairs, and in particular, this dedication of signage on a lot on a trail right. um, that had uh, signs about the Jackson uh, homestead, and um, probably maybe 30 members of the Jackson family attended that unveiling. And you mentioned too that uh, there was a uh, there was interest in in the the stones from the foundation of the house. Yes, um, the family asked about what was going to happen with the foundation stones and, um, you know, when it was clear they were going to be destroyed, you know, during construction, uh, they asked if they could keep the stones. So Maryland State Highways delivered them uh, to the church where Reverend Jackson um, is a minister and they built 
um, a little fire pit, uh, special social area, and kind of dedication to Melinda Jackson and their family. Yeah, and so there's there's this physical connection that that people in the community have to uh, this particular ancestral family and and their house and, and their belongings. That's correct, and and it was very meaningful to the family. Um, you know, they were very grateful for the information and the opportunity um, to not only see the site um, but to go into the lab and hold some of the artifacts yeah. that uh, their um, ancestors had um, held and worn. Right. Right, right, right. And some of those, uh, some images of, of the of the artifacts, like the toys, I know that are the the Maryland Historical Trust has a has a website that uh, where they they have information about archaeological sites from around the state. To away from the Jackson Homestead, which okay. uh, was amazing, considering they had no idea of its existence. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, I think we've covered everything. Well, I want to thank you so much for your your contributions to this project. You've been honest with me a long time, and I'm so thankful that you're part of the speaker series um, and and representing your generation. You know, the thing that I, I hope you walk away from and I, I keep telling you myself is it's really important for the younger generation to feel like you can speak up and you can be heard and be part of the public process. And that includes, you know, developing parks, um, doing interpretation at historic sites. We need to have young people involved because eventually you're going to take the torch and you're going to be doing this job in 20 years. So the earlier we get you involved, the more that you're going to be those advocates that we rely on to protect our, our community's local history. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for all your help as well. Thank you. Lots of stories have been uh, been lost in the in the county for a, a lot of families, and it's um, correct. It's great to see an example where where our archaeologists and historians have been able to, you know, recover some of that some of that lost landscape and and, and uh, forgotten history and be able to to uh, to bring it forward again today um, other any other thoughts uh, or things that you would uh, wanted to share about um, about this site or how it connects to the to the community um i don't you know i i think um not too much to say but i will say you know part of our research we did look into occupations and things so we know for example, that some of Melinda's children were active um, in expanding um, the in infrastructure in Montgomery County, um, you know, roads and logging um, to build roads. So, um, so they were they continued to be very active. Understanding how things are today, knowing the sacrifices that they've made, so we can sit here and, and make a recording such as this, and, and give those folks the honor and the glory that they deserve. Um, you know, in, in Reverend Jackson and the work that he that he's done, and and uh, you know his family. So it's it's certainly uh, uplifting uh, for us because this is this is great news. We're not talking about uh, something bad here. This is great legacy that we can pass on to generations. Well, Michael, I want to thank you so much for your time today, and and for you and your family for helping the commission to tell this both these ladies really important stories so thank you thank you for having us well our archaeologists working with the icc project unearthed a rare african-american homestead dating back to the 1800s as curtis crutchfield reports it's considered a treasure with unique family ties through the trees a few hundred yards from Route 29 and close to the Prince George's border, there's a rare archaeological find. Well, we don't know where the doorway is in this structure, which includes, um, it's about 23 feet by 13 feet. That's the size of the structure. It would have been about two stories tall with the sleeping quarters up above. To my right here would have been the living area. To my left would have been the kitchen. You can see the hearth here, which would have been centrally located. This archaeological site stands in the path of the ICC, the controversial road project that will link Prince George's and Montgomery counties. We turned the corner and came along in this location and found, and I'm wondering if it's still in place here. Did you guys already collect it? Yes. 
We found a button. Sometimes these white ports... During excavation work in 2004, archaeologists with the State Highway Administration came across the homestead of a former slave, Melinda Jackson. Researching old land and census records and maps, they located the descendants of Melinda Jackson still living in the area. From what they told us, it was like 27 feet by 14 feet, and it, had, it was two levels. So uh, that was a pretty big home for that time. And for her being just out of slavery to build a house that size or even to be in a home that size is amazing. And to find the artifacts that they had was just the richness of the site and other people living here. It was really amazing to me. This is a very small parcel, eight and three quarter acres. And uh, I was able to use 20th century um, real estate records because it, it kept shape over 200 years. So it's just something that's rare um, for a historian to be able to put a face to a name um, and to be able to follow a family tree forwards and backwards in time. It's just a, one of those things that make you tingle as a historian. Built in the late 1800s, the house that stood on this site burned to the ground in 1917, but the artifacts, old coins, buttons, scissors, remain. You can also see some things that um, I think are very important. This is, I think, one of the, a very personal piece to me. Um, this is a, a porcelain doll, but as you can see, it's it's an African-American baby doll. And you can see the eyebrows painted on there, ears. In fact, she even looks like she may have had pierced ears. We knew that Jackson Woods are in this area, that Jackson had lived in this area. Um, but we didn't know, we didn't realize that something had been preserved here, pristine condition over so many years, almost like divine intervention that either uh, development or highway or commercial property didn't just overlay this property. The Jacksons expressed pride in knowing that their relative after slavery was able to build and own her own home. And to be able to achieve what she did achieve through all those uh, mitigating circumstances, to me that's, you know, that's really character, that's really determination, that's really tenacity to want to continue on. Curtis Crutchfield, CTV News. And this was a story with personal interest for our Curtis Crutchfield. That's because like Spencer Jackson and Juanita Frazier, he is also a descendant of Melinda Jackson. Since 2008, Cultural Resources has produced over 75 interpretive signs to highlight the county's historic resources, including cemeteries. Today, Sara Lee is one of 15 cemeteries documented on county land managed by MNC PPC. In developing signage content, we work to incorporate every form of primary documentation at our disposal, be it archival records, material culture, or oral history. One of the best aspects of the signage process is working with stakeholders, concerned citizens like Ella or family members like the descendants of Sarah Lee. You're looking at a draft proof of the proposed sign for Sarah Lee, but it will evolve as Sarah's family shares their memories, details that will bring Sarah's story to life. I hope this film has planted a seed of interest. If it has, the Montgomery Parks has three museums that collectively speak to the African-American experience in the county. The Josiah Henson Museum, which just opened on April 23rd, covers the institution of slavery as experienced firsthand by abolitionist and author Reverend Josiah Henson. The Woodlawn Manor Museum analyzes how various populations in the county approach slavery, including free blacks and Quakers. And the Oakley Cabin, where patrons will learn about life following emancipation in 1864. Before you come, be sure to check out www.historyintheparks.org as county cover restrictions are still in place. If you're curious but want to snuggle up to a good book, here are some suggestions. I would be remiss if I didn't recommend Josiah Henson's narrative, which you can access anytime at the University of North Carolina's Documenting the American South website. In his 1881 edition, the very last paragraph of his book brings Henson back to the plantation where he was enslaved in Montgomery County and his last request is to be taken to where his mother was buried. And if you wanna learn more about African-American property ownership in the South or find out what 
the inside of homes occupied by African Americans in rural Maryland look like, then I encourage you to check out these two titles. And lastly, if you have any questions or have an interest in research, interpretation, or archaeology, or you have information to share about our cemeteries, please feel free to contact me anytime. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patrick, who is working behind the scenes for me and showing the movie. I want to um, start by just kind of introducing myself again, just in case it went by so quickly. But my name is Melaine Jackson. I am the co-lead for the Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan. And I produced this uh, film, the short film, to spark conversations. And I want to start by introducing our illustrious panel, who are also the folks who I worked with to produce this, this film, this amazing story of two phenomenal women. Um, and I'm going to start with Jamie. Jamie, who is the senior historian in Montgomery uh, Parks, Cultural Resources and Stewart section. And I want Jamie to first introduce herself, but um, as, a, as a start to the introduction, could you also share with us, um, share with us what drives your passion for history? Jamie? Um, well, I'm probably going to sound like a total geek here, but um it's partly just in my DNA. I, I had two parents who uh, both were interested in reading history. My mo mother loved to collect antiques and they drug the kids out to museums on field trips. And so it just kind of stayed in the bloodline as it goes. Um, I would also say it's partly, um, I believe in the search for truth and knowledge. And so I do feel that show history detectives for PBS, I do feel like I'm a detective at work every day and I love the tools that I have in my arsenal as a detective and I love the the hunt and and when the challenge is really substantial when you find the answer it's all the more empowering and just an awesome feeling to come up with those kind of answers. Absolutely I have a everyone who knows me knows that I have a passion for both art and history and those two things kind of go hand in hand for me as well so I appreciate you saying that, Jamie. I also want to introduce Ella. Ella, who is so sweet. She's a ninth grade student at um, Stone Ridge and is very passionate about social action and finding ways to make a difference in her community. Who says young people don't care about their community? Ella, I have the same question for you. And if you don't mind, you could share some more of yourself if you'd like um, in your introduction. But Share with us what drives your passion for history. Ella? Um, well, I love learning about all the rich um, local history of the African-American community in Burtonsville. Um, and there's just so much I've learned through this whole process um, and so much research that um, I've done that I've also learned um, in early 2020. Um, Jamie actually encouraged me to participate in National History Day where I shared Ms. Sarah Lee's story. Um, and also researched the Civil War. Um, and from that, I learned that there are two battles fought in Sligo and Blair. They're basically walking, walking distance from Miss Sarah Lee and her land. Um, and with this project, if I'm correct, I ended up winning fourth place for my division. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but so worth it in the end. Um, and yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know that you're very busy doing any homework and all these great things that come to a close or are you finished with school? Ella? Um, no, I have a few more weeks left. OK, OK, well, study hard, study hard. And thank you again for joining us tonight. I'm going to go now to Michael and, and ask the very same question. Michael, um, I know that you are the great, great grandson of Sarah Lee and current resident in the area. So am I. I live in Prince George's County, by the way. But um, would you also share with us what drives your passion for history, Michael? Michael, you're muted. All right. Uh, sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, there's an old saying, if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. So uh, history and, and understanding that is extremely important. Um, you know, in an interview, I spoke about foundation and it provides you with with some backdrop 
and a legacy and certainly uh, helps you feel better about yourself knowing uh, where you come from, uh, be it good or bad. But in our case, very good. I got, we have a very uh, important legacy in Montgomery County. So, um, you know, I really think you have to know where you've been in order to know where you're going or where you can go. Indeed, indeed. And so you said that you're still native in the area. Can you give us an approximate region of where you are now? Yes, uh, currently I reside right at the Prince George Montgomery County line. I can throw a rock over to Montgomery County, very near Sara Lee burial site. I'm at uh, Sawgrass and in Fairland Road. Uh, I'm still on property uh, in Montgomery County over, over off of Goodall Road. We're gonna be uh, building over there sometime in the near future. Um, most of the family lived in Montgomery County, so I spent a lot of time there. So I'm indigenous and, and uh, Montgomery County is home, it's family. Indeed, it's home for me too. Um, I, was, I was raised in Wheaton, so not too far from Fairland, but I definitely know, I know by virtue of working at the planning department a lot about the county. Yes. I'm gonna go with um, Brian now, Brian Crane. Um, who is also an archaeologist uh, with the Montgomery County Planning Department, has over 24 years of experience in archaeology. Um, I'm going to ask you the very same question, Brian. Do you mind sharing what drives your passion for history? So uh, as an archaeologist, uh, I, I love archaeology because it's the study of everything. You know, as a, as a student, I could never really make up my mind what I wanted to study, but but what's great about archaeology is that it it involves pretty much every discipline. I mean, there it's it's history and it's material culture and it's, you know, it's and it's a bit of geology and, and science and environment and all kinds of things. And uh, it is and it's also sometimes like being a, a mystery detective because we're our work is to try to recover lost landscapes. So my work here in Montgomery County involves investigating archeological sites and also cemeteries. Um, I, I'm responsible for maintaining the Montgomery County burial sites inventory for the whole county. And that includes doing research about the cemetery sites that we don't know very much about. I mean, there, there are some more than 70 that we don't, we know they existed, but we don't know exactly where they were. And so, through a combination of, of archival research and looking at old maps and deeds, and sometimes going out into the field, we can sometimes track those down. And and that's very exciting when we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It's. Mm -hmm. It's it's a thing, right? Picking a career. And um, I think nowadays young people are kind of changing careers or combining new um, skill sets to create new careers. So I, I second all encompassed career choices that have you learning multiple skills at any given time. I'm going to also go last but definitely not least, Farna, Farna Boyd. She's a senior um, or a professional archaeologist herself with 39 years of experience. And I'm going to ask her the very same question. Varna, what drives your passion for history? Well, my, my fascination is really about other cultures, past and present. Um, it really goes back to my fourth grade elementary school teacher who introduced us to cultures around the world um, and kind of opened my eye and um, kind of got my love of travel going. Um, and, you know, I love to explore aspects of other cultures. And while I can't explore past cultures firsthand, like I can, you know, traveling throughout the world, um, as an archaeologist, we get a little bit of a glimpse into what the lives of those people dating back a hundred, you know, hundreds to thousands of years ago um, were like. And, you know, puts a little um, more flesh on the bone, if you will, of, of history. Um, that, you know, is unwritten. You know, I think that's the important thing with archaeology is it's very often not anything you can find in a historic record. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you so much. 
I am going to go back to Michael now because I want to dig a little deeper into mm -hmm. the family history and the family legacy. I did see a question in the Q&A. I just want to encourage people to still keep putting your questions in the Q&A. I will get to them, I promise, before we conclude. Uh, we have a few, we have some time though, so I just want to kind of I'll peel back the onion a little bit and I want to go to go to Michael. Michael, um, can you simplify where you fit in to the family tree exactly? And is anyone in your family named after either Sara Lee or uh, Melinda Jackson? I happen to be named after my grandmother and I and I always am curious of how these names get passed on from generation to generation. OK, uh, well, my um, my mother, Geraldine Withers, her mother was Roberta, Sarah Roberta Lee, so she's named after Sarah Lee. Her mom was Marion Lee. Um, she was the granddaughter of Sarah Lee. So that's how I, I kind of fit kind of neatly into uh, that, that family tree. And on both sides, both on the Melinda side as well as Sarah Lee's side, there are several persons that, that share uh, Sarah name, Sarah Caroline, uh, Sarah Roberta. There is uh, Melinda uh, Odell Jackson that we spoke about uh, on, on the Melinda Jackson tree who carries a name. So, and there are several others who share uh, naming rights, I guess you would say, both for Sarah and Melinda as, as you move down the family tree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of loop the question from the Q&A into the conversation now because it seems pretty, mm -hmm. pretty um, simple. I'm going to go to Jamie really quickly to talk a little bit about the signage um, and what what the program entails. I think there was a question in the Q&A. I can read that in a second. I'm just trying to pull it up here, but it just asks, it just asks <laughs> what exactly is the trail park sign? So I guess there there's just a clarification on on which I guess which one is which and 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 I just thought that this might give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you do and uh, some of the work that you've been doing to support this effort. Jamie. Well, thank you for letting me do that and thank you to the audience member that asked the question. So there there's two signs that you saw in the film. One was uh, for the Melinda Jackson homestead site and Verna, you can correct me if I'm wrong. That's tied to the SHA. Um, ICC project, and that's off a trail near uh, Briggs Cheney. Um, so that sign is not part of Montgomery County Parks. Um, it's a wonderful sign, though. Um, uh, Montgomery Parks does our own interpretive signage. As I said in the film, we have a, between 75 to 80 interpretive signs now throughout the park system. Um, and what I love about interpretive signage is it does give the, us the ability to interpret sites where we don't have a museum or we don't have staff to give the public information about what they're looking at. And the wonderful aspect about these signage projects, as this film showed, is I get to work with uh, members of the community, whether they're concerned members of the community like Ella or family members uh, of the, in this case, Sarah Lee's family, I get to work with them. And it's great to have those opportunities. I, I love the, um, in the video from Mr. Crutchfield's um, segment on Melinda Jackson, when they spoke to the archeologist and she said it kind of, she tingled having that ability to put faces to names. And that's kind of been that way for me for the Sarah Lee project to finally, um, I, I've seen all these names on a family tree, but now to speak to some of the members and see these photos uh, and spend time. I spent time Friday with uh, Raymond Lee and Bernadette King at the cemetery, and it's just an amazing experience to be able to, to put all the pieces together and work together on these signage projects. Indeed. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you for your service. Yeah. I'm going to go to Brian now because I know that he has some online res resources that I know he wants to share, but I just want to provide some context and say that um, the African American Historic Sites Project launched about five years ago and Historic Preservation, our division in the planning department, is committed to, to an honest and equitable representation of the county's complete history and heritage. Um, and so, Brian, my question for you is really about um, what have you been working on 
lately. Can you give us a little bit of background about how some of the euro might be a reason to put into the community? Um, that I'm, I'm I'm sorry. The question got got garbled. I, I think there was some some. Uh, I'm so some I'm so sorry. I can repeat it. No problem. There's there's a little bit of lag. <laughs> okay, no problem. I can repeat it. Um. I was basically asking is, I know there are some online resources that uh, Historic Preservation has been working on, and I thought mm, this might be also a good opportunity to maybe weigh in about how some of those resources could be of use to the community, uh, providing from background information context. Sure. So uh, we've got a, a couple of things, so I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and that's... Um, Okay, so um, so um, so uh, this uh, this website is uh, the the about the burial sites inventory. So we heard uh, we heard a lot about uh, the Sarah Lee burial site, and and I mentioned in, in my comment a moment ago that Montgomery County maintains an inventory of all the burial sites in the county. So you can find that um, on. Um, on uh, on our website, so you know um, planning. Um, you, know, you can go to the the planning department, and from there to historic preservation, and from historic preservation, uh, you can find um, the burial sites inventory. I, I know that's sort of uh, burrowing down a little bit, um, but I, also if you Google uh, Montgomery County burial sites inventory, you'll also get get this site. So this has information about the the ordinances that County Council passed in 2017, the guidelines that we developed, and we also have a, a link to the the map. This is a sort of a sub view of mcatlas.org. Um, and I'm going to make this full screen. So this shows all of the, the burial sites that we know about uh, in the county. And we can uh, we can search for a uh, for a place. So I'm going to enter Fairland. It pops up and it zooms in. And, and so here we go. Um, this is the, the Fairland neighborhood. And um, I'll zoom back out a little bit. So so here if you see where my my cursor is. That's where the Sara Lee uh, Cemetery is. And if I click on it, you get some more information. And um, you know, a little bit of basic information, and then there's a link to a, a form that was prepared by Montgomery County volunteers, uh, the volunteers with uh, Montgomery Preservation Incorporated. And so, you know, they these are uh, Montgomery Preservation uh, did a big volunteer project in <clears throat> in 2018, sending volunteers out to over 200 burial sites all over Montgomery County to fill out forms like this, including uh, including the uh, taking photographs and 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 uh, getting some other information, um, but you'll notice that it's it's not the only uh, cemetery that's in the the area. And I call your attention to another approximate site that we're trying to get a little bit better information about. This one was recorded by volunteers uh, in, uh, before th 2006. And there's not a lot of information about this one. Uh, it, we think probably now it's underneath Columbia Pike. But um, but um, back quite a, quite a long while ago, um, there were people who noted that there were uh, names in that cemetery, including Griff, Conway, and Emma Jackson. So uh, there were probably Jackson family members who uh, were related to Melinda Jackson. So we're hearing a lot about the the Melinda Jackson Homestead site. Well, that was right here at the intersection of of 29 and the the intercounty connector. So right there is where that archaeological site was, uh, and it was investigated because of the construction for the intercounty connector. And then a little ways north was probably a, a community cemetery that may have included the uh, ancestors or family members of Melinda Jackson. So um, no, another resource I want to tell you about uh, just MC Atlas. This is the general MC Atlas um, 
you know, this is the GIS information system for the for the whole county, and it's and it's got a, a lot of uh, a lot of um, information. And again, I can zoom in on Fairland, and and so um, here I can pull up all of the historic preservation information that that we have for that area: burial sites, national register sites, uh, master plan sites, and so on. And you'll notice that um, you know there's the uh, uh, you know, there's the uh, uh, Conley House Green Ridge as a, uh, a plantation house that was built in, originally in the early 1800s. The present house dates from the early 20th century, but that still survives along um, along Old Columbia Pike. You can see it from the road. And you know, there's also information in in the system, this public system, this mcatlas.org, uh, property information. You can find information about um, uh, plans that are coming up. If I click on, uh, you know, regulatory plans, I can just pull up. I'm clicking everything here, so this is probably now <laughs> so busy it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. But as a member of the public. You can get information through MC Atlas about everything that's going on in your part of the county. Projects that people are proposing, who owns the property, as well as a little bit of information about the history, including uh, cemetery locations and uh, historic historic sites. That is a lot of information, That's but I wanted to, I mean, it's all good information because I think everyone could use that information, including myself. Um, but that makes me think about backing up for a second and asking the question that maybe some people know and maybe people people don't know, but I'm going to go to Varna for it to answer the question about really what does an archaeologist, what, what does an archaeologist add to the planning and parks uh, process like for those of us who are not familiar with um, archaeology, um, can you kind of describe how the work of an archaeologist might be essential to the work of parks and the planning process specifically? Barna? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, I think critically, one of the things archaeology can do is help the county define important sites. Um, especially those of underrepresented communities um, in the historic record. Um, you know, African American communities, minority women, children um, that tend to be a little invisible um, in the historic record. Um, so I think it can, again, as I mentioned earlier, it can kind of flesh out what we know about the past. Um, it also puts the community into a context. Um, so that it's it's not one history, it's many histories um, that work together to really represent what the community is about. Um, and I think importantly, it's a way um, to reach out to the community and involve the community. Um, so many people find archaeology interesting and fascinating. It, it's a way um, to talk to them about history that, you know, is often not no offense, Jamie, as dry um, as as some uh, historic texts and things can be. <clears throat> so I, and let me say as an historic archaeologist, we use historic records all the time. So I'm kind of teasing Jamie there. <clears throat> indeed, indeed. But back to, back to I'm going to go to Michael first and then I'm going to go to Jamie because I have a, a question about uh, cultural resources for Jamie. But first I wanted to ask Michael, Michael, um, your family has been doing lots of research about both Sarah Lee and Melinda Jackson, but how did you find out that these two individuals are related? Because we actually found out in the course of producing this film and, and meeting you and talking with you and Ella that, that these two women are actually related? Michael? Sorry, Michael, you're muted again. <laughs> One second. Yep, great, we can hear you. Sorry, something must have happened. We can't hear you now. Okay. Oh, there you are. There oh. you are. Can hear you. All right. So we we've known that the the Lees and the Jacksons are related. 
Uh, we've known that all along. Um, through you know, via Mr. George Jackson, Uncle Fred, if you call it, and and other members of the family. So we knew that we were related. And as uh, this discovery happened along during the time of the construction of the ICC, um, more of the I guess you would call foundational history of the family started to come to light uh, by virtue of this uh, discovery. And as we started moving down the tree and up the tree, we we came across the intersection, you know, a, a, a real uh, definitive intersection between the two uh, ladies, Melinda and, and Sarah Lee, and started looking at looking at really where they placed. But we, we, we've always known that uh, you know, we were cousins, uh, you know, Spencer and all of us, so we knew that, but um, th this whole process has helped us understand the, the uh, you know, the history between the Jackson and, and the Lee family and how intertwined they were. Did you, did you happen to know about these online resources? And if you didn't, don't worry. It's more or less, would you actually use these online resources to maybe find other um locations or um just parts to your history your legacy yeah yes now we we I've, I've started learning about these online resources by the time they were doing the research for melinda jackson um i'm a lifelong member at the round of missionary baptist church where some of the descendants a lot of descendants are buried and they started documenting the cemetery there and has actually have some of that information online and we've discovered other uh, family burial sites around the county, uh, you know, about that same time and understand there, there's other history. You know, there's a there's another burial site that we have along Padamel Road it used to be called Sitka Baptist that we're doing some research on. Of course, there's Ash Memorial in Sandy Spring. Um, so there's a lot of places. And now that we have uh, this information online can help us with our research and, and trying to discover, you know, where these relatives exactly, you know, where they are. So yeah, I we have been introduced and, and found them very helpful. We are nearing the close of our q and I again want to encourage people to put some questions in there if you have questions. Um, I want to go back to Jamie really quickly and then I'm going to maybe conclude with allowing people to do uh, we we actually have a poem that we want to um, show you too that kind of relates back to these two women and um, unfortunately we had the poet locked and booked but unfortunately she's not feeling well so we we actually didn't get to have the poet herself but she has given us permission to actually show the film on YouTube it's live it's recorded on YouTube not live but it's recorded on YouTube and I'll share the link in the um, in the Q and A as an announcement but Jamie uh, just to the to the point of what is a cultural resource like could you tell us a little bit more about cultural resources and specifically the ones that parks owns sure uh, so cultural cultural resources is basically any kind of tangible remains that speaks to human existence human activity in the past and um, this film highlighted uh, what I would consider the two most vulnerable forms of cultural resources because they're underground. I think when you say tangible, your mind immediately goes to things that you can touch that are above ground, uh, homes, churches, buildings, things, uh, farms. Um, and that's, as we've seen in the film, that's not necessarily the case. Um, now Montgomery County Parks, we uh, manage right now, we're up to actually 16 cemeteries. Uh, some of them are, are like the Sarah Lee Cemetery where the tombstones are, are, are gone. Um, but as we know, that doesn't mean that the, the burial site is gone. It's still a, a resting place. It's a sacred ground. It, it warrants respect and it also warrants interpretation. And that's why uh, we've been moving forward in parks to put interpretive signage at our cemetery. So Sarah Lee is our third cemetery. We're working on the fourth one is Montgomery Chapel Cemetery, which is another African-American cemetery uh, in Little Bennett Regional Park. So on the other side of the county. And I, you know, I also want to throw out um, 
we do a lot of archaeology in Montgomery County Parks. Uh, we have mul hundreds of archaeological sites. And um, as Varna and Brian spoke to, those archaeological sites uh, really provide us the really cool tools uh, to speak for people and communities that are no longer with us. And so when I say these sites are vulnerable, it's really important when uh, planners, uh, park developers start thinking about projects. Part of their due diligence is to spend the time to research these communities and look for these lost uh, people, lost homes, lost communities, and make sure they're part of the process for us moving forward. We only, always want to look back forward if we want to move forward successfully. So history is integral to the planning process. Agreed. I couldn't, I could not second that enough. I, I in fact, um, was inspired by the Sankofa uh, West African Dink, Adinka symbol. And it's part of the reason why I was, we were fascinated because it's it's not just me, it's a team of people, but we were fascinated in, in coordinating this effort in, in this session by how history is not something that you just put on a shelf and you come back to when it's convenient, but it actually is a, is a way, it's data. It's like you look at history to see what things are, could possibly occur in the present day. And so this poem that we're about to hear, um, it gave me, um, I, I, I was sent this poem in a, in a text message one morning and I thought to myself, we absolutely have to have this poet. Unfortunately, again, she is not feeling well, but again, I just want to give us a moment of pause to reflect and memorialize both Sarah Lee and Melinda Jackson with this spoken word poem. Um, Philip, if you could cue up that poem for me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sir Lillian Green, and I'm going to do a poem today entitled Sheroes in Tribute to African American Women in this Women's History Month of March 2021. Sheroes. A woman, visible yet unknown to many, hard work she did plenty, from sunrise through sunset plantation fields tasted her sweat. Fields of cotton, tobacco, rice, and sugar cane. These crops knew her footprint, knew her pain. The pain of a black woman enslaved. In Africa, her seed was born. From Africa, her ancestors were torn. Through the Middle Passage, she came, stripped of her culture, stripped of her name. Enslavers brought this woman to her knees, disregarded her tears and pleas enslaved her children, alienated her mate, claimed the brutality of slavery was the African fate. She was forced to suckle babies, not her own, raise the children of others until they were grown. Yet due to her skin color, gender, and so-called class, she could see a future with slavery in the past. That future too many did not live to see, but she knew one day her descendants would be free. In the meantime, she rose. She rose as a heroine unnamed to most about a life she could not boast. Though she often faced a locked door, the instinct of freedom held the key to her core. From her core, she rose. She rose to be who she was meant to be, much more than a plantation mammy, more than a nursemaid wiping a child's nose, more than a hands on her hips cartoon pose, a woman. A woman who rose on behalf of her race, notwithstanding what she had to face. She founded schools during and after the Civil War. She demanded freedom, education, and more. In science, business, and math, her accomplishments broadened America's path. Yes, into her bosom, enslavers' children talked. Across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, her future walked. Even as she did chores in someone else's home, cooking, cleaning, and washing clothes, she rose. She rose with the power of her creator's hand for freedom and the future she took a stand. As a leader in the Montgomery bus boycott, her carpool strategy taught the world a lot. Although men were seen, heard, and known, her leadership was the power behind the throne. Without her, 
The bus boycott would not have succeeded. Jim Crow laws would not have been defeated. Boycotts, sit-ins, freedom rides, the instinct of freedom, her constant guide. She demanded the title of Miss, refused to be summarily dismissed. Courtroom disrespect she did reveal to the Supreme Court, she did appeal. For America, she made enduring contributions. From America, she has yet to receive proper attribution. But she rose. Even when she was not in the best physical health, she rose with an abundance of spiritual wealth, wealth inherited from African traditions, traditions that serve as spiritual nutrition. She taught Sunday school, embraced church rules. She was a white gloved usher. She sang in the choir. She stayed prayed up to lift spirits higher. She rose as a nurse, a doctor, an abolitionist. She rose as a pilot, a lawyer, an activist. This woman helped chart her people's destiny, the feminine half of their history. The half needed for the whole, the whole story which has not been told, yet she rose. She rose like no other, a woman, a daughter, a sister, a mother. A woman who made a way out of no way. This heroine of the past is called a shero today. There were sheroes all around. Sheroes of courage and vision most profound. They were hidden in plain sight, working hard day and night, working to bury racism and hatred in concrete tombs, working for children yet born from future wombs. Their names many have not heard, yet these women prove the status quo was absurd. Women of substance without pretension, black women who deserve honorable mention. These women are sheroes of American history. Their lives must not be a mystery. For them it's time to stand and be proud. Their names must be spoken aloud. There are countless sheroes to acclaim, and these are some of their names. Lucy Hughes Brown, Mary Hamilton, Rebecca Cox Jackson, Nettie Langston Napier, Charlotte E. Ray, Beulah Ecton Woodard. Remember these sheroes, research their deeds, honor them as models of how to proceed. Speak the names of the countless others, unsung daughters, sisters, and mothers. Speak the names of the sheroes you know. In you, their legacy continues to grow. Thank you so much, She Rose. So, we are coming to the end of our session. It is 7.45 right now. I do want to go back to Ella and ask Ella two questions for you, Ella. Um, how has this research inspired your family? That's the first question. And do you think you will continue to stay involved with this project? And if so, what role would you like to play? So I guess that's three questions, sorry. Um, to answer the first question, like I mentioned um, before, I was definitely encouraged by Jamie to participate in National History Day, where I learned a lot about the Civil War and the burdens on the Silver Spring area. Um, and I also learned a lot about the African-American community and all the rich history. Um, rich and local history of the community. Um, and to answer the second question, um, I would definitely like to continue um, staying involved with this project. The whole process has been so much fun. I learned so much and met so many amazing people on the way. Um, and I'm also looking forward to learning about what life is like post the war for women, um, like the rights, daily life, etc. cetera. Um, and in terms of future for this project, I'd really like to find a way to encourage other community members around my age to get and get them involved in exploring and preserving the rich local history of our community. So. You are so right. You are so right. And I am so proud of you. Not that you need my praise, but I know your mom's proud of you too. And the whole community of Montgomery County is proud of you. So no pressure. But <laughs> you probably want to stay involved and we encourage you to stay connected to us even well past this speaker series. And that's that's from my heart, sincerely. I really want to encourage you. you. And if 
there's anything that we can do to help and support you by all means by let's let's stay connected to each other and i also want to give you an opportunity to just express any closing re remarks is there anything that you wanted to say and didn't get a chance to say or didn't get a chance to express now's the time um i would just like to say thank you so much for having me on this call this whole process was again so much fun and i've learned so much so thank you so much you're so welcome. You're so welcome. I'm going to go to Jamie. Jamie, are there any things that you wanted to say and burning to say and just didn't get a chance to say them? This would be the time. Well, too. First of all, I, Ella, I, I want to thank you so much. And I really want to applaud you for telling people your age that history is fun because Varna is wrong. History is not dry. OK, and we have lots of wonderful projects in Montgomery County Parks and we're soliciting young people, young ideas, fresh brains. Please contact me if you have any projects you're interested. I can find work for you to do. And my second comment is um, I am so very appreciative for the Lee family for all the work they've already put into this project. And um, and I I am so excited about what information they're going to bring us. Just seeing the photos. I know Ella feels the same way. It's just amazing to put faces to names. And I hope me and Ella and all the family get to keep moving forward on this project and to learn from each other. And I'm really excited about what the future brings for the cemetery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you, people don't know how much time it takes to pull all of this together, but Jamie has been an absolute trooper. And I want to thank you, Jamie, also for, from the bottom of my heart, we'll stay connected, obviously, through this master planning process. But I just wanted to say I couldn't have done this without you. I really, really, really could not have done this without you. I want to I want to acknowledge your work and your in your service. So thank you very much. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna turn to Brian and I'm gonna ask for forgiveness because y'all, I messed up in the video. I was multitasking and I messed up, but he is the Brian that I was talking about. So I want to clarify and claim my mistake. Brian, thank you so much for being a part of this. This is the time to say the very thing that you didn't get to say during this panel discussion. Are there any closing remarks that you'd like to give? Um, well, I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone that that uh, participated in this in this project and, and, and I'd lo love to hear from members of the community about, you know, uh, what about the, the history and, and the archaeology and the past landscape that, that they would like to learn about more. Uh, there, uh, there have been some questions I've seen in the in the um, in the Q&A and, and I would say that that in the historic preservation program, uh, we do actively research the history of African American communities throughout the county, uh, especially in areas where we're working on a, a, a particular master plan update, like like at Fairland. Um, but we're also actively uh, looking for all of the, the the cemeteries that that we think we know something about, but we don't know exactly where, where they were. Or cemeteries that that have just been lost. We're trying. We are trying to identify and find those. So uh, it's a it's a definitely a that work is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> so it's something that that uh, I'll be, you know, we'll be working on in, indefinitely. But um, you know, it, it's definitely and it's a, a collaborative process. I mean, we we get tips from the public and from descendants all the time about historic sites and about cemeteries and about other places that are important to people that then help us uh, with the, the resources that we have sometimes to to put two and two together and find where things were where one person has part of the picture and someone else has another fragment of the of the jigsaw puzzle um, but until you get all the pieces together you really can't get the whole picture uh, assembled as happened here at, at uh, for the Melinda Jackson house. I mean, there, there were descendants that had parts of that story. You know, there were historians who had part of the story, and then the archaeologists had part of the story. And when when all of those people got together, much was learned that that no one person or a set of people knew. So we, we love to see that happen. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do that. That's why we do this work. I mean, we have to remember that we are planning. We are talking about buildings like Jamie has said in the video. We are talking about buildings. We're talking about architecture, landscape of architecture, which is my passion. But 
I digress. Uh, but we also, more importantly, are talking about people and their stories, as Tony had said earlier. But I'm going to go to Varna. Varna, thank you so much for all the work that you have done in this process. And I also want to say, um, I could not have done this without you either. So <laughs> I want to thank you so much for being a part of this. And if there are anything, anything that you didn't get a chance to say, this would be the time to do so, please. No, I, I just appreciate being given the opportunity to participate. Great, great. Thank you so much. And Michael, Michael Withers, we want to acknowledge your presence uh, with a huge thank you because this is part of your family's legacy. And um, thank you so much for letting us be a part of it. Thank you for um, your energy that you brought to this. I know that it was a lot to kind of wrangle the kittens because I was doing the same thing on my end with um with my kittens. And, and I know that you were trying to get everybody in your family to get on the, the, the same accord and get the information as soon as possible. So I want to acknowledge that and say thank you. And I want to ask you if there's anything that you didn't get a chance to say that you really, really wanted to say, this would be the time. To so, Michael. Uh, thank you. I, I remember to take the mute button off this time. So I'm ready. Um, Th th this process is is uh, very important. Um, progress is very important, but uh, it was mentioned a while ago. This is about people, and and from the you know time that I was young and remember living in some of the black settlements around Montgomery County, um, started out in, in Hillendale, uh, then moved to Gaithersburg, and then to Sandy Spring and then to Good Hope. One constant theme for all those areas is that they're disappearing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, another effort that I'm involved with is affordable housing. And that's very uh, important for, especially for Montgomery County. So as we progress, as we work on our master plans, do not forget about the people. Um, and, and make room for the people as we talk about progress and, and, the, and the black communities um, that have existed in this county. Don't forget about them with the progress that you're making. Um, make room for the people uh, with your progress, with our progress. I'm not going to say your, with, with our progress and continue to fight for, for the little guys. So. We appreciate the work you're doing. Um, let's take it to the next level to make sure we're preserving spots for everybody as we're preserving the history, which is so important to to those who don't understand where they came from. So it, it will certainly give them something to stand on and make them feel the importance and the belonging that they should feel uh, for this area. So thank you again for all your hard work. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Moline. Thank you for the archaeologists. And, and Ella, keep on keeping on. Uh, very, very proud of you. I uh, want to encourage you in, in every way. Um, continue with your initiatives. Uh, continue to be a self-starter. Uh, thank you for getting this ball rolling. Indeed, I think I picked the right person to bring us on home, but I do have some I do have some um, housekeeping things that I have to do. Folks, you'll see um, pop up in the chat or the q and I should say um, you'll see some links. Please, please, please take a moment and uh, complete the surveys for the links, especially if you're uh, trying to see continuing education credits for either APA or ASLA. This session has been approved and so has the next session. We hope that you will join us for the next session. We hope that you have learned something from this session, but the next session is on the importance of people first transportation planning. It's on the May 25th, same time starting hopefully. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with us through technical difficulties and hopefully this was the first one, so it only gets better from here. I will say that um, I have enjoyed talking and sharing and and being a part of this first session very much and thank you for giving me the honor and privilege of being your moderator this evening thank you very much tanya tanya stern our deputy planning director at the mm -hmm. planning department for for your opening remarks and your leadership we truly want to say thank you for that for your service 
Um, I will conclude by saying, you know, be a sponge in this world. You know, it's it's not about being perfect. It's not about always having the answers for things. It's more or less about learning. It's it's about growing and collaborating with one another. And so I hope that you have been inspired to do some of this legwork, some of this hard work of doing the due diligence on your own family's legacy. And I hope that um, you will stay with us, that you will continue to um, join us in the next two sessions. This again is a three-part series. This was the first session. Um, did I forget to say anything? <laughs> I'm going to open up. Um, I think I think we're done, but um, hopefully I didn't forget to say anything. <laughs> and if I did, please don't hold it against me. <laughs> this has been really fun. It is 7.57, so we are still on time, good people. So go have dinner if you haven't had dinner. And thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good evening. Bye. Yeah. All right.